Sponsored by Sentry. With their performance monitoring tools for iOS, you see mobile vitals that actually matter, helping you learn how each release is performing over time. Find out more at Sentry.io. Everyone knows SwiftUI does a great job of building apps with system components like lists, buttons, navigation views, and more. But I doubt most folks would call this kind of day-to-day -day work much fun. So in this video, I'm gonna walk you through building something fun with SwiftUI that's also really beautiful and, bluntly, unlike anything you've seen before. To follow along, you'll need Xcode 13 with iOS 15 or later, ideally on a physical device, plus one picture from my site, which you can get from this URL up here. It gives you a single spark.ping file, which you'll need for your project. Now, at the core of our little experiment project here is going to be a particle system, which is commonly used in games to make effects like fire, smoke, rain, and many more things like that. They're surprisingly easy to build. We'll start small and iterate as we go. I think you'll be impressed how easy SwiftUI makes it. To get started, choose Create a New Xcode Project, then choose iOS and the App Template, then press Next, I'll call mine Motion and press Next, and then Create on my desktop. Now this is where you want to drag in your asset. So go to your Asset Catalog, grab Spark.ping, pull it on in, and there we go. Now uh, I'm going to hide a bunch of the, the views in my Xcode window so we get more sort of screen space to see my code as I go. So let's hide the preview, hide the uh, nav on the left, and then make this thing nice and big, not full screen, just bigger, please. Like that, there we go, okay. Our first step is to think about what makes a single particle in our uh, particular layout. What does a raindrop need to know? What does a snowflake need to know? And there are all sorts of values we could store, things like how they're spinning, how they're accelerating, how they're falling with gravity, whatever. But here we'll just add only a couple, basically the X and Y coordinate, the position of the, of the particle, plus, the date it was created. Uh, in addition to this, I'm also gonna make our particle conform to the hashable protocol. So we can add our particles to a set, so we can remove them easily and more efficiently over time. So I'll make a new Swift file, Command N, choose Swift file, and I'll call this thing particle.swift. And then I'll give it this code here. So we've got a struct called particle, which is hashable. It'll have an X double and a Y double and a creation date. And this have a default value of date.now.time interval since reference date. So they, as soon as they're made, they know they're made right now, is what I was saying. So that's one particle, a single particle, a single drop of rain, one spark from fire, one piece of fairy dust, or whatever you're trying to work with. That's one particle. One level up from that is a particle system which will hold a whole bunch of particles. So it's gonna say, first, the image it's gonna render as its particle. Is it a snowflake? Is it a raindrop? Is it our spark picture, for example? It'll have a sequence, in our case, a set, storing all the particle instances it's working with, so it can move them around smoothly, and then where it should place itself in the UI. So the particle systems generate position in our UI. Now, the first two of those are straightforward, right? The image surrender's fine, the array of particles, that's fine. The last one, where to place it in the UI, is slightly more complex because I don't want to hard code values here. I don't want to say you're at X200, Y300 because it wouldn't scale well across devices. And so instead of using that, we'll use the same solution SwiftUI uses for things like anchors and gradients, a unit point type which goes an X and Y between zero and one, where zero is the left or top edge, and one is the right or bottom edge. So it's much more scalable in terms of device sizes. So make another Swift uh, file here, Command N, call this thing particle system dot Swift, and then give it this code. This will be a class, so we can change it as it's being used, particle system. Its image will be the image of our spark like that. Now this will need a SwiftUI import, by the way, to use that image from SwiftUI. Then we'll have our particle set. This will be a set of particles, like that. And a center point will be unit point dot center, like that. 
Now to bring this whole thing to life, we've got to update our particles, which means to remove any that are old, they are dead particles, the, uh, the s snow has melted or the rain's fizzled away or the fire's dissipated or whatever, um, and then create new ones regularly. So we're always generating new fire or new smoke or new uh, rain or whatever. And for now, this will be really simple, a simple method, which will just make new particles every time it's called. So we'll say in here, uh, func update, with a date, which is a time interval type, so we can do date math more easily. Inside here, we'll say our new particle is a particle with x, our center x, and y, our center y. And then we can add that to our set by saying particles.insert new particle, like that. So the final part of our step is to write some SwiftUI code to actually render our particles to the screen. And this can be done really efficiently thanks to the timeline view and canvas views that were added in iOS 15. Uh, the former timeline view lets us re-render content on a regular schedule. Great for things like widgets, for example. Uh, and canvas lets us do freeform drawing, adding images, text, shapes, and more. It's really powerful. And the combination of those two is amazing here because we can render our particle image, that spark.ping file, again and again and again, once for every particle, and do so extremely efficiently. It's really, really nice. So to do that, we want to add a new property to content view over here, uh, which will have uh, our particle system being made. We'll say at state private var particle system equals particle system. And before you jump into the comments for this, I wanna make it quite clear. Yes, we are saying at state here for a class instance, not at state object, and that's intentional. This thing is not an observable object. It will not publish change announcements. Uh, and so as a result, we can't just, uh, we don't need to use state object here. At state's fine. We're just saying, keep it alive. Act as a cache, please. And so when the view um, is recreated, which it will be on a fairly regular basis, it won't destroy the particles and recreate them. So uh, it, it's a great way to handle class types that aren't observable. Anyway, with that in place, we can now fill in the body of our view here, which again will use a timeline view and a, a canvas. A timeline view will ask you how often do you want to refresh yourself or to redraw, and we're gonna say animation, so we get really, really fast redraws. 60 or sometimes 120 times a second. And then our canvas inside to do our custom particle drawing code. Um, the initializers, both of these pass in some values to work with. Um, the timeline will tell us, um, hey, uh, how fast I'm going and what the current time is. And the drawing context and size will come from the canvas. So we'll get a variety of things passed in. So we'll say, there's a timeline view here, running on uh, an animation schedule, so really fast timeline coming in, then a canvas with a drawing context and our available size coming in, then our drawing code here. I'll ask my timeline view to ignore the safe area so it goes edge to edge and has a background of dot black. So it's nice and clear where our particles are. Now inside this drawing code, we've got to do two things. First, call that update method on our particle system, which right now will make new particles regularly. It's really important to call that regularly. And then, of course, draw every particle. Now, remember, particle positions are stored as x and y values between zero and one. I'm on either left or top, or the right or bottom. That's what zero to one means. And in this case, we can multiply that zero to one by our canvas's size to get the actual drawing position. So it'll say, hey, you've got, you know, um, 480 points of height to work, for example and you're at uh, 0.5, great, you're at 240. Boom, done. So replace your current drawing code here, comment with this. Let timeline date be our timeline, dot date, dot time interval since reference date. And pass that into our update method here with timeline date, like that. Date even, there we go. And now do our drawing. So we'll say for particle in particle system, dot particles, our x pods will be particle.x times by size.width. And our y pods will be particle.y times by size.height. And finally, we can say context.draw, 
there's a whole bunch of options here. We're going to say draw particle system dot image that spark picture at CG point X is X pos Y is Y pos like that. And that's enough all being well to make our program actually run. Um, of course, who knows what comedy mistakes I've made along the way, but that should actually work as a starting point. So I'll build the code. It'll take a, a few seconds while I'm recording, of course, because it's extra slow just for me. Come on, Xcode, you can do it. You can build the code. Otherwise, I'm going to resort back to hideous dad jokes. There we go. Succeeded. You got lucky. And then press Command R and it'll deploy to my device, my iPhone sitting right here next to me. And um, this is going to look fairly simple, I think. Let's find out. We should see. There we go. A big white circle. That's it. Nothing but a big old white circle there. It's not doing very much. I realize you're not very impressed and that's fine, particularly because I said how great this was in SwiftUI. Don't worry, it's gonna get much better. Most of our work so far was about creating data models. What's got a particle, what's a particle system, yada, yada, yada. There isn't much SwiftUI code just yet. And in fact, it now takes just one modifier onto our timeline view to bring this whole thing to life. Um, and it's gonna be a shortcut. I'm warning you now, it's gonna be a shortcut because it's a starting point so we can move forward and do more interesting things. But that's okay, we'll replace it soon enough. And so, uh, before ignore safe area, add this new modifier, dot gesture. And I'll say my gesture has, inside it, uh, we'll do a drag gesture with minimum distance of zero. And when this is changed, tell me the drag that came in, I'm going to set our particle system dot center dot x to be equal to the drag value location x. So where their finger is on the screen divided by UI screen dot main dot bounds dot width. And the same thing for y. So it'll be y here and then y here and then height here. And we're saying is now Every time the user moves their finger over our timeline view, read the x, y coordinate of their finger and match it to the, the location of the particle system. So it will follow them around. And it's important we divide uh, their finger location by the UI screen main bounds width and height because we're storing values as 0 to 1, not as absolute coordinates. Um, this is the shortcut. This is the massive hack workaround shortcut thing. You really shouldn't use UI screen main bounds width and height, particularly on iPad or Mac, obviously, which wouldn't work very well because um, we think about uh, the width of the whole screen. In iPad, you have split screen, you have slide over, yada, yada, yada. It's complex. Fine, there's a shortcut here on my iPhone. It's fine, but it's just a shortcut. We get on the bigger things later on. Anyway, with that in place, go ahead and press run again, and the whole thing should look much, much better. So now I drag my finger around, I can draw this beautiful sort of glowing white line, which is very, very nice, but it's neat. I know it's neat, it's, but we can do so much better. For example, we could say, I want the older points to fade away over time after let's say one second or so. And to do that, we just adjust the opacity before we make our drawing call. So we could say uh, our context.opacity equals, and I'll start with this, timeline date minus particle dot creation date. So this will yield a value here. So let's say like, oh, I'm 10 seconds in. And this will say, well, I was made nine seconds ago. Uh, therefore, that minus that gives one. Now, if it was made 10 seconds ago, it would be 10. So it'd be 10 minus 10, and it's sort of uh, just over time, right? What we want to do really is flip this around so the opacity fades out over time. So I'll say we want one minus that. So rather than the opacity increasing, the opacity will decrease over time. So now uh, I'll run it again. And hopefully we'll see something even nicer. I can now drag around like this and boom, the, the lines fade away over time automatically, which is really, really nice. So we're getting there, right? but we can do even better. With another small change in our drawing code, we can tell SwiftUI to blend these particles together so overlapping particles get brighter and brighter as if they were merging together like, uh, you know, almost like blood particles in, in whatever, glooping together. It's remarkable. So we can say, let's put this after the update call outside the loop because we want to do this once. Context 
dot blend mode is dot plus lighter. Blend these particles together brighter and brighter and brighter. So now I draw around over here. Look at that effect. It's really, really nice now. See when they overlap, it gets really bright like that. Boom. Lovely. And this effect looks particularly good, I think, when you add some color to the particles. And this is another one liner in Swift UI. I told you it was straightforward, right? We could say something like context dot add filter dot color multiply, and I'll use dot green, a nice bright color. Let's press Command R again. See how this looks. And now, so I get green normally, but when they overlap, it gets bright white like that. You see when it's lots of them together, it goes super bright white, which is really, really nice. There we go. Okay, much better, I think. Now, that code looks pretty good so far, but before we move on, there is one important change we've got to make, and perhaps some folks are already screaming this at the screen at me. Um, we're making all particles fade out right here, which is great, but we're never actually destroying them. You know, we're fading them out, but they're still there. And so SwiftUI is drawing lots and lots and lots of basically invisible particles. So it gets a lot of RAM, a lot of CPU time doing nothing at all. And the fix here is to update, uh, sorry, to change the update method. So it removes old particles that are over one second old. It just trims them away. And we use the same technique here, which subtract uh, one from the current date and then loop over all the particles and say, were you born before that date or not? If they were, remove them. So over in our update method here, I'm gonna say uh, our death date is that date minus one. So anything older than that should be removed from our set. We can now say for particle in particles, if particle.creation date is less than death date, particles.remove, and I'll say remove that particle. So trim out old ones and now our little starter part system is actually done. It's much more efficient now. This thing will never run out of memory at all. It'll carry on going forever and ever and ever because it destroys old ones and makes new ones. So much, much better. Now, I think that looks pretty good. But when I showed this to my daughter, Sophie, who's very much into coding and Swift UI and now Python as well for some reason, um, she said, oh, that's, that's, that's nice, Dad, but can you make it do rainbows and yeah, of course we can. We can totally make this thing do rainbows. It's only a small hop from this current code to where you want it to do. Um, you know, rather than giving the entire particle system uh, the same green color, we instead give each particle its own color, moving across the whole color spectrum. And hey, if you don't like rainbows, suck it. <laughs> My kid wants to see rainbows. I'm doing rainbows whether you like it or not. Um, so this takes a few steps. First up, in our particle, we're gonna say there's a new value in here, which will be the hue of this particular particle element like that. Second, we're gonna do the same in our particle system. What is the current hue I am working with? Now, this is gonna change over time, so it'll be variable equal to 0.0, .0 by default. Now, inside our update method down here, we've got to create our new particles using that hue value and then increment it a little bit. Now hues run the range of zero through one, from red to red. And if you go beyond one, you wanna go back to zero again. So what we're gonna say is this, make the particle with a hue of hue, and then adjust the hue upwards a small amount. I'll do 0.01, and then wrap it around. So if hue is greater than one, hue minus equals one, like that. So make sure hue increments all the way from zero to one, then back to zero, back to one again, like this. And it's red on both sides. It will smoothly go around and around and around. And finally, now in our particle system over here, we want to zap this current call to add filter. We don't want to use the same fixed filter everywhere. It doesn't make sense anymore. Instead, we want a unique filter for every one of our particles. And this raises an interesting problem. As you saw a moment ago, we say context.addFilter to add a filter. But... If I say context dot filter, you'll see it only add filter. There's no remove filter. Once a filter's on the context, it ain't coming off. And so we've got to find a way to remove a filter over time. The answer is you just can't remove filters. It isn't possible. But fortunately, SwiftUI's canvas context, this thing here, uses value semantics. And so we can get a copy of that canvas 
add a filter to the copy, and then throw the copy away again and again and again. And it won't affect all the later redraws. It's lightning, lightning fast, and it will never adjust the original context, which is brilliant. So in our drawing code down here, inside our particle loop, we're going to say var context copy equals our context. Get a copy of the context. And then do context copy dot add filter with color multiply. So add it to the copy, not to the original. And I'll use color here with hue saturation brightness. The hue should be our particles hue. Saturation should be one, brightness one. We'll then modify the context copy's opacity, not the original opacity, and then call context copy.draw. So it draws with our custom filter like that. So we're creating uh, a color based on what the particle has uniquely right now, applying it only to the context copy, so the next particle won't be affected by that. We won't have red and green and blue multiplication because this won't work. Anyway, let's give that a try. See how that looks. So now I can drag my finger around and boom, gorgeous rainbow writing. And it'll still blend together nicely. It's sort of like a white hot thing in the middle as the colors overlap, but it also changes constantly with the hues as you go. So one happy child. Anyway, before we take a rather surprising turn in a very different direction, I want to add one more little fun tweak to our experiment here. Rather than just drawing each particle once, I want to draw it four times at different positions on the screen, making a symmetry effect, almost like a kaleidoscope. Again, this takes very little work. It's extremely efficient and it looks fantastic. First up, we're going to add a new property to content view that will track the four flips we want to do, the four pieces of symmetry we want. We'll say there's an options property. This will be an array of tuples. So I want to use colon here, sorry. Array of tuples like this. Flip X is a bool and flip Y is a bool. Like that. I'll provide this with four values. Our original one will not flip in either direction. Then we'll flip an X, but not Y. Then not in X, but in Y. And then in both X and in Y. So the four pieces of uh, the quadrants of our canvas we want to draw to. And now we want to adjust our drawing loop here. Now, to avoid doing extra work, you want to try and think about the way we're modifying filter and opacity, just doing that once, once per particle. But then of course, XPOS and drawing is done for every flip option for every particle. And so our loop starts off now by getting a copy of our context like this, applying the filter and the opacity once for every particle, not for every piece of symmetry, but just for the particle. And now we'll do for option in options inside there. And that's where we're going to modify our position stuff to get where we're going to draw. Of course, we've now got to say, take my flip into account. So we'll say this X pos is variable and our Y pos is variable. And inside here, if our option has flip option even has flip X enabled, we'll do X pos equals size dot width minus X pos. To come from the other side that far, count from the right basically. And then if, scroll down slightly, if option dot flip y, y pos equals size dot height minus y pos, like that. And then go ahead and draw as normal x pos y pos. Let's give that a try, see how it looks. So I'll draw here. Oh yeah, look at that. Absolutely gorgeous and honestly, so little work in Swift UI. It's just so, so nice. I love it. Anyway, that is enough futzing around with Canvas. I hope you agree it's lots of fun and looks nice too, but we're not done just yet. So far, I would say this is all pretty standard stuff, but it's taken enough time. From here on, I want to take this experiment in a very different direction because right now we have this little hack in place so we can draw with our fingers, um, which is great, um, but it's, it's just so dull. We can do this whole thing in a much more interesting way by bringing in Apple's Core Motion framework. Now, Core Motion gives us a brilliantly simple API for reading the physical device orientation of our devices all by using CM Motion Manager. 
and we can ask this thing to start delivering motion updates to us, then pass a closure to use when new updates arrive. This should not, should not be run on the main queue because you might get a whole bunch of updates coming at the same time, the user's moving around the device quickly, uh, and so it can slow down your UI. So give it a temporary operation queue to deliver to and it'll work much happier. Anyway, we don't want to pollute our beautiful Swift UI code with core motion code, so we want to wrap it up in a custom class you can reuse in other projects if you want to. To do that, press Command N, make another Swift file, and call this thing motionmanager.swift. Replace its foundation import with a core motion import, then add this new class. We'll say class motion manager with a capital M in manager, please, Hudson. There we go. Has a private var motion manager internally, which is a CM motion manager. It'll have three properties pitch of 0.0, .0 roll of 0.0, .0 and your of 0.0, .0 to reflect the three ways you can tilt your phone around. So we've got default values for all three of those, plus our motion manager here. But obviously, as soon as this thing is created, our motion manager thing, we want to start looking for real data from core motion to read the actual device orientation. And to do this, we can add initializer. We'll go ahead and start reading for device updates. So we'll say initializer here. We'll call immediately our motion manager dot start motion manager Hudson. Come on, motion manager. Did it again. Motion. I see why it's our module name. Motion manager dot and we want start device motion updates to with handler like this. Um, don't give this thing your main queue. Any other queue is good. Like a regular operation queue is fine. Um, that is fine. With handler, this thing here will take our motion update plus any error that took place. So I'll say, uh, give me a motion object and an error object coming in. We've got to use self here. So just to be sure, we'll also add a uh, weak self so you don't sort of have this uh, capture loop. Then we'll say, first up, does self still exist? Uh, guard let self equal self, uh, self. And does motion have a value or not? Let motion equals motion. If either of those failed, just bail out. We don't care, don't do anything else, just bail out like that. And then, We'll copy the values from the motion's attitude, where the device is in physical space, uh, into our three pitch, roll, and your properties. So I'll say self.pitch equals motion.attitude.pitch. Self.roll is motion.attitude.roll. Self.your is motion.attitude.your, like that. And now that we start reading updates here, we also want to stop reading them when the class is destroyed. It's important to do this. So we'll add also a little deinitializer. We'll do motion manager dot stop device motion updates like that. And that's it. That's our new class done. It's really, really straightforward. And now back in content view, we can put that into action immediately. We can say uh, up here, I want to have a motion handler, please. So I'll say uh, at state private var motion handler motion handler is a motion manager like that. And now all we're going to do is update our X and Y position of our uh, particle system when we call update down here. So down here, we'll read the new value, pop it in there and see what we think. So let's say down here, our particle system dot center is unit point. And this will be uh, from the center offset by the device motion somehow. So I'll say it's 0 0.5 plus motion handler dot roll. And then for Y, again, start from the center plus motion handler dot pitch like that. Now all being well, I can run the app again and uh, control it with my phone. Let's find out. There we go. So I'm now not touching the screen at all. I'm just tilting the phone nice and you can see me uh, drawing things by tilting my phone. It's really, really nice. But you know, doing this, I'm, I'm feeling tired. My hands holding this heavy phone, turning it around all the time is, is tiring my poor hands out. Can we do better? Yes, we can. Our story is not done just yet. How about if we make the motion happen 
without even having to move our hand. Just hold our hand still, heavy phone, and uh, handle motion anyway. To do that, you want to go to your apps settings up here, and then choose the info tab, and then right click somewhere here, and choose add row. And scroll way down to say, I want to go to privacy, I'm looking for privacy, motion, usage, description, like that. And for the text here, we'll say, we need to read your movements, like that. What did that change? Bluntly, nothing, it'll still do exactly the same thing. But with one extra change to our motion manager, we can make this whole thing significantly weirder, fun, and again, unlike things you've seen before. We're gonna change CM Motion Manager to be CM Headphone Motion Manager. If you look carefully, I've been wearing AirPods this entire time, little AirPods Pro here, and now you know why. If I run the app again, I hold the phone right here, I also say, do you want to allow us to read your movements? I'll say yes. As I move my head around, now you can see it's controlling the entire drawing thing by reading my head movements up and down relative to the phone in front of me, which is really, really fun, silly, beautiful, and again, unlike what you've seen before. So, <laughs> you have seen how we can use Timeline View and Canvas to make some beautiful effects how you can layer on improvements like blend modes and coloring and symmetry and more, plus of course Sophie's rainbow effect. Then tie the whole thing together with some accelerometers and even AirPods to create something quite remarkable. But even then, we've only just scratched the surface of what a particle system can do. There is so much more they can do, and in fact, SwiftUI is more than capable of doing all of it, all thanks to those beautiful timeline view and canvas types up here, they're so, so good. I actually did a two hour live stream just on particle systems. We build all sorts of extra detail with a, a UI to adjust the particles in real time. Um, if you look at this link on the screen right now, you'll find that video, it's like I said, two hours long, but there's lots and lots of particle details there. Anyway, I promised you something fun, something beautiful, something unlike anything you've seen before, and hopefully, you'll agree it's worth your time. Honestly, I can't remember the last time I saw anyone create rainbow lights on their phone using their AirPods. I hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time, folks, take care.